Hello, this is Ralph Morgan uh, for the Beginning Networking course, and we will be talking about the assignments for week two. So, uh, all assignments will be due by midnight on 9-4 uh, this month uh, coming up here. Uh, so, 9-4, have them all in by midnight. We're going to read chapter one, which is the basic network concepts. We're going to complete some CompTI labs. This is where you kind of get that uh, hands-on experience uh, a little bit here. So complete the exploring the lab environment, which will be worth 20 points. And to submit that, you just take a print screen of the completed uh, screen and upload it. And I'll have a folder for that. I've got some videos for you to watch that are going to... Uh, th these are really good videos by Professor Messer and we'll have the whole series uh, throughout the course. So um, we're going to have how to pass your network plus exam, the uh, introduction to IP, common ports, understanding the OSI model, introduction to Ethernet, switching, uh, network switching overview, broadcast domains, and collision domains. And then we're going to go into the total tester, and I have the directions here on how to get registered and get uh, in there. And once you're in there, we are going to take the pre-assessment and then when you're done with that we will upload that to the uh, correct folder and then you're also going to take the pbq quiz now the pbq quiz is a performance-based question so if you plan on taking the network plus exam um, you'll have anywhere from two to six of these type of questions these are like a gui type um uh, they're kind of like a GUI type of uh, question where you have to click and move stuff and uh, set configurations and, and that kind of stuff. So um, the reason for the pre-assessment is it's always good to kind of judge what you already know about a subject, um, especially when you're looking at certification exams. So when you take this, um, if you score really well on it, then that means that you probably know a lot of the stuff in the class already. And if you don't score so well on it, then that's why you're here. Um, so and even if you score well on it, um, you'll still get quite a bit out of this course, I, I would think. So the pre-assessment this is where you'll upload that the print screen and the pbq quiz and then you're exploring the lab environment you'll also take a print screen of that and uh pop that in there so uh let's take a look here i'm going to show you the total tester now so this is the total tester and the instructions like i said to get into this are all documented right here so just follow these directions should be pretty easy to get in there um and then here's the pre-assessment and then here's the total tester this is just a a, a a bank of questions that you can take for practice tests but the one i want you to do now um is the pre-assessment and when it comes up it's gonna look like this and then you just click here and it'll get started, hit start, and then you'll go into uh, the pre-assessment. Oh, it's 25 questions, you get 25 minutes, so a minute per question. Um, the assistance is off, so we can see how you really do the first time out. Um, so, uh, let's see here. So we're gonna uh, do that. And then uh, let's just take a look around while we're in here. Uh, I'll show you the total tester here. So the total tester, um, when you take these, uh, it's a good idea to hit that, uh, that you like to customize it and that you also want assistance. Um, so when you take uh, assistance, um, it shows you the correct answer right after you answer it. So that way, if you miss it, you don't make those wrong associations and take 90 questions and then uh, find out which ones you missed. And then you kind of already made those associations. So um, I was advised to take it in the practice mode and your customization um, you could change the number of questions you could change the length of the test um, you could pick the different uh, exam objectives so if you're having problems in network operations or whatever you can just take questions on that so um, this is a pretty good tool to use and um, if you hit book resources um, then you have uh, the performance based quiz over here so it's already selected in this uh, case. So we're gonna, um, we'll just go ahead and show you what that looks like. So you just have different uh, tools and or, uh, options and you can drag and drop them where they go. Now, um, DNS is uh, TCP UDP uh, 53. RDP is uh, 3389. Um, 
and let's see. So let's just see what we got here. Oh, oh I guess there's more. So, um, so these are over port numbers. So there's quite a few different port numbers. And when you hit submit, um, you must complete the question. So we'll just drag all these over just for time's sake here. And you hit submit. And then it shows that we got it wrong. You may need a new professor. <laughs> so try again, and you can keep going. Um, and so you'll go through this whole test, and you'll upload the uh, results that you completed it. Um, it does have the solutions um, in here. So if you're having trouble, you can take a look at the uh, solutions and kind of see how uh, they did things. And then some extra stuff in here um, is they have uh, these different videos and exercises that you can go through I'm not going to be assigning too many of these but they're out here for you to use and then um, as far as the labs go so this is what your lab environment will look like and you just click here uh, let's see you click here to get into the main lab and then um, all the labs are down through here. Um, you can click the start button and it kind of runs you in order. Um, but you'll be doing the exploring the lab environment and it'll fire up like a virtual uh, machine for you. And then, um, so let me see here. Oh, it looks like mine may have uh, be having some problems here. Um, Okay, should still be um, active, I think. So, we'll go over here and let's see if we can get back in there. Oh, wait a minute. It expires 826. It expired yesterday. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so, um, anyways, when you get in here, uh, you'll see what the, the labs look like and uh, just follow the directions. It's pretty self uh explanatory and I'll be showing you this each week um, so uh, so we should get the hang of it okay so that covers what we're going to be doing for the first week so now let's take a look at the uh, Kindle read I got mine on the Kindle reader you may have the um, hard copy or, or whatnot but I got the Kindle that way I could uh, screen share with you guys and uh, show you uh, my screen while we talk about things um, so um, what we're going to be talking about is identifying characteristics of a network, servers, workstations, and hosts. Um, so we'll get a little bit more into this. LANs, WANs, and MANs, and types of networks. Um, so a LAN basically is going to be uh, like a, in a company, and it's going to be a network. It stands for uh, <clears throat> local area network, and it's usually like just in a single building, um, such as a office building or whatever and then a WAN is a wide area network which spans multiple geographic locations and then the uh, MAN is a metropolitan area network and it can it's uh, going to be larger so that would usually be like a city or multiple buildings uh, at, or whatnot so um, so what we'll do real quick is uh, So let's see here. A uh, picture is worth like a thousand uh, words. So uh, right here we have the WAN and it's showing like a large geographical area. A MAN is showing like a city or, or a camp, big camp, college campus or something. Then a LAN is going to be your individual um, building. So if there's anything that you're uh, reading here and you're not quite sure, just Google it and look at like. A, a picture of it because a picture really helps um, uh, show <laughs> what the words can't sometimes um, so um, let's see here so a can sand and a pan so the can is going to be a campus area network um, so they're talking about universities and so forth and then uh, SAN is a storage area network and it's gonna be a high-speed specialized uh, network to provide storage space 
uh, to other devices on the network. And then a PAN is a personal network, uh, personal area network. So you can actually be walking around and have your own network. Uh, that's with the Bluetooth. I'm sure a lot of you used your phones with your uh uh, your phones with your um, headphones and and so forth and then um, let's see here now oh, it's touchy so types of networks um, there's uh, going to be uh, different types of networks of course so yeah you're going to have peer-to-peer -peer and server-based so peer-to-peer -peer, it has no dedicated server so the the uh, function of a server is going to be uh, so everybody can put their files up on uh, one particular uh, machine and then everybody can access it and then also a lot of the software can be loaded on the server and so forth um, so server just acts as a as a place to uh, keep everything um, in one common area so that's the network server so you would typically have a switch that would connect from your department back to the network server and you would be able to access the different files and so forth on there. Um, as far as the peer-to-peer, -peer, um, there's no dedicated server. Instead, a number of workstations are all connected for the purpose of sharing information or devices. Um, so the, the uh, drawback to this is like if one of the machines is off, um, then you won't be able to access that machine. So if there's something on there you had to get, then you probably won't be able to get it unless you have the ability to turn it on. Um, and then uh, the advantages to it um, would be uh, basically that you avoid the cost of a server. Um, so that's about the only reason I could think of to use that. Um, and then you would find this in very small organizations, nowhere real big. All right, um, so the client server networks um, and uh, oh yeah, so the client server networks, uh, what we're talking about here is the peer-to-peer -peer networking. You can't do your day-to-day -day administration in a single place, so um, having just that one server. So client server networks, so this is the client and this is the server here and um, you uh, would be logging in here and then there would be files on here that you might have to access so a lot of times the servers are broken down into departments and you might have like engineering manufacturing hr and um you'd have to have access to get to the different uh, uh parts of the server <clears throat> um the advantages uh let's see here so the data files uh they're all stored on one server, so you can run backups on this, and uh, you only are backing up one machine instead of a whole bunch. That's a good uh, advantage, and let's see here. With the client server network, the network uh, server stores a list of users who may use the network resources, and... Uh, holds the resources as well so you'd have to have an account and you'd have permissions based probably on your job title um, and that would determine what you could access and then uh, they also have uh, there's a bunch of different types of servers like file and print servers application servers web servers directory servers uh, so forth um, and Let's see, so file servers often have the following characteristics. They have large amounts of memory, uh, real fast hard drives, because you're going to have a lot of people that are going to be hitting this, uh, multiple uh, central processing units, CPUs, fast input-output buses, uh, fast network adapters, redundant power supplies, hot swappable hard disk, and power supplies. Um, and then when you get into the application servers, um, this is where they're going to have different applications. So a lot of these are going to be... Uh, maybe database related. So like Microsoft SQL, Oracle, Microsoft Exchange Server, IBM Lotus. Um, so these are just some of the different types of application servers that you could have. Uh, web servers are gonna uh, run your websites and so forth. So um, let's take a look at a peer-to-peer. -peer. So so if you just do it like a simple Google on, on, on the stuff, there's these charts that uh, give you a lot of information on this type of stuff. Um, I'm kind of a fan of the images because you can just kind of 
um, take a look and you can see like a peer-to-peer -peer, there's no central server and you're gonna have just a bunch of machines so like if this machine dies you may lose the files that are on there or um, if it's not turned on you may not be able to access it or whatever but here it doesn't matter if these machines are on or off like if you're at this machine and your coworker is off today and their machine is uh, turned off it doesn't matter you can still access your files so that's kind of one of the big differences there alrighty <clears throat> Um, so I'm just going to let you read about the different types of servers. Um, so uh, basically the, the servers are going to be <clears throat> the central unit and they have different purposes. So there's different kinds of servers that you'll run into. And uh, just go ahead and read uh, around here and see uh, what the different kinds of servers are and kind of get a handle on that. Um, internet, intranet, and extranet. So um, the internet is... Uh, basically what you're used to using um, to go out to like Walmart or whatever so um, that's the internet the intranet is like an internet but it's internal to a company um, so you might have an intranet that you uh, access at your company and nobody outside the company can get to that and it just has company information on it and uh, a lot of companies use it for um, uh, displaying messages to uh, uh, their employees or like uh, different events that are happening and that kind of stuff um, and then the extranet it would be built for um, companies uh, the company's intranet and it'd be used by internal employees but need to be extended to select business partners or customers so you kind of extend that and you give access to people outside the company um, typically going to be customers, uh, different business partners, things like that. And you could put um, information out there that could be shareable. Okay, um, there's several different types of network topologies. Topology just means uh, what's it look like, basically. Um, so don't make any of this stuff harder than what it needs to be. Uh, just think in simple terms for now. We have the bus topology, star po topology, mess to mesh topology, ring topology, and a hybrid. So um, each one of these uh, is going to have its own look. And so like the bus, just think of it as like a bus. It has these different bus stops and it has a route that it goes down and it stops at each uh, particular bus station and lets traffic on and off. Um, so this is what the bus station looks or the bus topologies look like. And the bad part is if I cut that uh, right there, um, then the bus is broken and the whole network is down. So that's one of the disadvantages to it. And some place that you might uh, actually see one of these is just a real small business, like a real estate office or something like that may have one or a small uh, mom and pop place. Um, oh yeah, here we go. So if a, there's a break in the cable, the entire network will go down. So that's one of your exam watches. Um, and then the advantages is going to be cost that's um and complexity it's really uh pretty easy to put that together okay star topologies so um it's where all computers are connected through one central device known as a switch this is one of the more common uh things that you'll see out in business so you're going to have a switch and um and that switch will connect all these different computers. And then the switch, this this is only a small uh, portion of what we're looking at as far as the whole network. But what we're trying to show you here is that all the computers are connected through one central point. So if this computer fails, it's no big deal. If this computer fails, no big deal. If this switch fails, it is a big deal because then none of these computers can access the network. So, um, so typically these switches are pretty reliable. Um, what I used to do is, uh, I would have one on my bench at all times that was, uh, pre-programmed. Um, and, uh, if I had one that would fail, then I could just switch them out real quick. Um, so <clears throat> you'll see the star for sure, um, out there in the networking world. Um, mesh topologies, it's where, uh, let's see here. So you have every computer is connected to every other computer, basically, um, is fault tolerance. So, um, 
this one here uh you won't see that much uh probably it's uh expensive because it's a lot more cabling and uh different components and stuff and uh so if this fell if this line right here fails it doesn't matter because this switch can still talk to this switch through this route um or router so um they have multiple paths to get to where they're going so like if this one failed then he could still go here or here um and so a lot of times you'll see these in like military facilities maybe um uh, probably some law enforcement uh, type things uh so they, you might see them in uh areas where uh they have to have redundancy ring topologies um so it's just kind of like the bus but it's a ring um and all computers are connected uh, via cable that loops in a ring or circle uh and the signals travel in one direction on a ring while they are passed from one computer to the next um with each computer regenerating a single so signal so it may travel the distance required um a lot of times in these rings they'll actually have two uh cables so they do build in redundancy so if one fails it goes over to the next one um the advantages of the ring topology is a uh, signal deg so basically what happens is uh the further a signal goes it loses its uh uh strength and so these can uh repeat the signal and recreate it and uh transmit it again and then it has uh the ability to continue on and get to where it needs to go um also when you hear about uh signals getting weaker and weaker um that's called attenuation actually so um you'll have signal attenuation uh let's see here so if one computer failed or the cable was broken the entire network could go down uh with newer technology however this isn't the case the concept of a ring today is that the ring will not be broken when a system is disconnected only that the system is dropped from the ring uh because the ring is more of a logical ring than a physical ring nowadays so um so a lot of times like i said they, they they have actually two cables they'll use for this um and then they also have the ability to ignore the computer that went down and then a hybrid um would just be like uh you usually find these in companies that are growing <laughs> and they're just in a hurry to uh, add more network and they just throw stuff together so you could have a mixture of these different ones that we kind of talked about um, wireless, of course, uh, is going to be um, like your Wi-Fi and stuff, and I'm sure everybody's pretty uh, familiar with that. Um, so you would have some sort of a cell or a AP, and that would connect to all these computers wirelessly. Um, wireless uh, has been a great thing uh, for computing and networking because it reduces the amount of cable that you have to have and then also um <clears throat> a lot of people like to pick their computers up and go to meetings with them and so forth and so they can just uh unplug from the network and uh take it with them so it's created a lot of benefits in the workplace and then also like uh it uh, provides the ability to add wi-fi for like your customers so you go to mcdonald's and you get on their wi-fi or whatever um so they're able to provide the additional services for their customers um okay so for the infrastructure um with a wireless infrastructure there's uh an access point and each of the wireless clients connect into order to gain access to the network the ad hoc with a wireless ad hoc network the wireless clients connect to one another without the need for wireless access point now mesh is a network in where each of the wireless access points connect to each of the other uh to create the wireless uh, network uh infrared um mostly going to be found in like remote controls for your tv um and it's line of sight so um it has to work uh pretty close to whatever you're uh trying to use it on mostly going to be uh remote controls for tvs nowadays um 
there's tons of advantages to wireless um you know it, it reduces the cost of networks because you're not buying all the extra cable and so forth uh disadvantages of wireless uh is um you can have signal interference blockage interception uh, a lot of uh, uh noise uh fluorescent lights can cause problems um and then uh hacking uh it's a lot it's open to hacking well not open but it's easier um so there's some drawbacks, um, but there are uh, preventive measures you could put in place. So for the network exam, you need to be able to visually recognize the different uh, network topologies from the network exam, from the network diagram. So make sure that uh, all those kind of make sense to you. Uh, let's see here. So the point-to-point and multi-point. Um, <clears throat> The point-to-point -point topology, also known as the host, to host is one uh, system connected directly to another system, uh, and then the point-to-point -point multi or point-to-multi-point -to topology uses a central device that connects all devices together. So um, then we're kind of talking about the uh, star, logical versus physical. Um, so you'll hear logical, and physical, and uh, let's see here. So. A logical topology is not necessarily how things are connected, but how the data is transmitted. And then the physical is going to be um, the opposite of that. So the logical is a topology is not necessarily how things are connected, but how the data is transmitted. So um, it could be laid out a certain way, and it doesn't mean that the data flows that way. And then the physical would show the physical layout of how the network looks. So uh, this is kind of confusing a little bit, and um, uh, we'll we'll get into this just a little bit more. Um, so the physical topologies because they represent how the system are connected and laid out in a network. So the physical is just how it's laid out, and the logical is how the electrons and stuff flow, the signals. Uh, segments and backbones so the backbone is going to be the main part of your network uh, or it could be like for instance like if you have several buildings like in a campus the the fiber or whatever go that goes from building to building could be considered a backbone and then uh, the segments are just going to be the different sections of your network for the most part let's see so network media and connectors uh, here we're going to be talking about um, the cabling is the medium for the transmission of data between host of the lands lands can be connected uh, using a variety of cable types such as unshielded twisted pair uh, coax or fiber and each cable has its own uh, advantages and disadvantages so when you hear network media we're basically talking about cabling and then of course they, there's different connectors so like uh, for your uh, RJ45 you're going to have uh, or for your uh, twisted pair you're going to have RJ45 uh, for computers or you could have RJ11 for fax and phone uh, for your fiber optics, you have SC, ST, and LC type of connectors. And then for uh, the coax, you could have uh, like the F connector, uh, RG59 uh, and 8, I believe. So different kinds of connectors. Um, and then coax of cable, uh, for the most part, uh, this used to be used a lot in networks, but uh, that's fading out. And it's mostly used for, like, uh, your cable television and stuff now. <clears throat> and let's see here. So usually it helps. Let's see if this will work out here. Okay, so um, so RG58. So let's just take a look at RG58. So if we take a look at RG58, um, this is what we're talking about. So it has a, a copper inner core. It has some uh, insulation and shielding, and then the outer. Um, this uses what's called uh, the uh, um, RF effect. Basically what happens is that RF energy just rides. It's the, uh, they call it the uh, 
uh, skin effect. And so it, that signal just rides right along that uh, uh, inner core. And here's what some of the connectors look like. So you've probably seen these. You probably have some in your house, I, I would imagine. Um, so, and right here they show you, but that's not the best uh, picture. Um, and then RG8 is going to be kind of the same thing, but different. So here's your RG8. Um, so it's just different. Uh, <coughs> it's different type of cable, but uh, does the same type of thing, uh, just using different instances. So um, twisted pair. Um, so you're going to have, let's just take a look at twisted pair. So in your twisted pair, um, you have uh, the color scheme of these wires, and then you have uh, shielding, and then you have the outer uh, outer coating. Um, so, and then they also have one that's unshielded. So unshielded is a uh, unshielded twisted pair. So UTP, and then twi uh, shielded pair is STP. Um, so the shielded has this foil in here and the foil is the kind you want to use for the most part because it uh, protects the signals from interference. So um, these uh, wires have, a, have to get connected a certain way. There's a thing called 568A and B and it's the wiring scheme for that. So if we just look at uh, 568A and B. <clears throat> this shows you how you have to wire these uh, up. So if your company is using 568A, you you wire it up like that, B like that. And then um, these also have certain uses for uh, crossover and straight through cables. So let's see here. Um, here's another exam note, so pay attention to those. And let's see here. So our twisted pair, we talked about the unshielded and shielded. And so here's uh, the different categories. So they have category one, two, three, four, five, category five and five uh, E and six. And uh, those are probably the most popular ones today. Um, these uh, category one, two, three and four are pretty old. Um, and you can see <coughs> that uh, the first one would only do voice and then the others will do data and they show you the speeds um, so the faster the better um, and then the wiring standards we talked about straight through cables um, so a straight through uh, cable uh, <clears throat> is going to be wired up uh, to where uh, let's see So you'll be connecting uh, computers to, let's see, uh, let's see, the straight through is for uh, different devices. So a computer would get connected to a hub or switch with uh, straight through and um, the crossover would be like devices. So computer A to computer B. So if you're connecting two computers, two hubs, two switches, then you're going to want the crossover cable. So that's pretty important. If you don't remember that and you go to try to wire some up, you'll probably have some weird problems. Um, so here is another one of those exam uh, alerts. Those are uh, important, so pay attention to those. Um, and then, uh, so connecting a computer to computer, switch to uh, switch, and switch to hub, router to router, and computer to computer. So you could see things like that. Uh, T1 crossover. Um, this would be a crossover. It's created for the same reasons, uh, but it's used with uh, T1. Um, and the T1 stands for, uh, th this is a large circuit that's going to be uh, brought into a building and then taken to the internet. So your router would typically uh, connect to the uh, T1. So let's see. <clears throat> 
so th this is uh let's see yeah so uh let me find a better picture here Okay, this is a good um, picture for that. So, oh, it's not gonna take. Let's take a look at that. Okay, so what you're gonna have is this cabinet. It has these little cards in it, and these are T1s. And so you'll have a router. Um, you'll have a equipment rack out off to the side of here you'll have your router switches servers and stuff and the uh t1 will connect to the router and that's how uh the company gains internet access so um that's what that is used for and you could possibly have to have a crossover cable with this and then here we talked about the 568 a and b wiring standards um and they do have a table here so And I guess that's our table here. So um, I, I personally like the pictures on the internet better where you can see the uh, actual collars and stuff. Crimpers. So the crimpers are what you're going to use to uh, uh, do the uh, putting the connectors onto the different cables. Um, and these are pretty easy to use. So um, you have to know the different tools for the uh, uh for the exam and here they kind of walk you through how to do one and uh, they're talking about fiber optic cables and the different types of connectors so so yeah <clears throat> you'll have to be able to put these on um, and uh, I know that over at Harbor Freight they sell the crimpers and the connectors and stuff real cheap um, that's where I usually get mine. And let's see here. Transceivers. Um, uh, these are used to connect uh, devices to networks. And um, a lot of times uh, these transceivers are used as uh, repeaters. So, and here they're talking about uh, fiber optic cables. Um, so show you some fiber optic cables so looking at the fiber optics cables um, these are the different uh, some of the co more common different types so the SC FC LC ST and these all have different uses that you'll uh, read about and so forth um, but uh, a lot of people, when they're ordering these connectors, they uh, get confused and they order the wrong ones. And then <laughs> when they go to hook up their network equipment and stuff, they uh, can't because uh, these are very um, specific to what you have to have. So make sure you, if you ever have to order these, uh, make sure you don't get confused and order the right ones. And uh, let's see here. Universal uh, serial bus uh, is just USB. I think everybody's pretty familiar with that. You use your flash drives and stuff. It's just uh, another way to connect uh, to computers. Uh, Firewire um, and let's see. They have... Uh, I don't think Firewire is used quite as much anymore. Um, but uh, it's still out there. And then they have DB9s for uh, RS-232 and db 25s So RS-232 was a, a old protocol before like TCP IP. Um, so like if we look at uh, network protocols, So these type of connectors here, um, this is a 
tester actually, but um, these type of older connectors would use uh, like RS-232. So we'll just look at RS-232 connectors. So it'd be uh, connectors like this. Uh, they're just older connectors. They're, they're getting phased out. Um, so when you see uh, this is the connector DB9 and that's for the protocol that it used. Uh, to communicate and then there was DB25 as well um, they also can uh, network over power lines now and uh, what's uh, more common I would think would be the uh, uh, Ethernet uh, power over Ethernet where they use the Ethernet cables to run uh, power so uh, if you didn't have an electric outlet you can use the actual networking cable to run some power and then they have it over HDMI and uh, so forth, so it's expanding. Uh, media converters, um, if you have two different types of, you have fiber and you have uh, RJ45 uh, Ethernet, um, you can buy one of these and stick it in the middle, plug them into the appropriate ends, and this will uh, convert for you. And then single mode fiber and multi-mode fiber. Um, there's connectors for those and single mode and uh, multi-mode they have different uh, they're used in different uh, situations like for uh, long haul or short haul uh, communications and then uh, fiber to coax and then single mode to multi-mode fiber um, let's see here CSM uh, CSMA and CD, uh, which is carrier sense multi multiple access with collision detection. Um, it's a uh, networking technology, and uh, it will sense um, and determine whether a signal is ready to present. And if they're so, basically, what happens is it like it monitors, and when it has an open availability to send a signal because the other ones aren't, it goes ahead and sends it. And if it uh, has a collision it has the ability to basically resend the signal um and then collision avoidance uh it's not as popular uh so there's csma and um not quite as popular because uh it sends a signal to see if it's free and then and then it sends another signal so it, it kind of ties up the bandwidth i guess um, modulation techniques you have digital and analog uh, so modulation um, so real quick here let's uh, take a look at some images again so analog is a signal that flows like this and digital flows like this um, so uh, examples of analog are my voice. When I talk, it comes out. And if you looked at it on a spectrum analyzer or a, a oscilloscope or something, it would look like this. And then uh, digital, so like if I was monitoring voltages off of a computer board or something, it would look like this. So um, digital and analog, uh, just understand what they kind of look like and different examples of those. And then when you get into modulation, um, it's the term used to alter property or characteristic of a communication signal. And these are the two ways of doing that. So that this gets very, very complicated. Um, for now, you just need to understand the, the basics of it. And, um, and if you have any uh, additional concerns with it or whatever, uh, check it out online somewhere or get with me. And then... Uh, multiplexing uh, basically is where, uh, so let's see here. So for multiplexing, basically what happens is you have a whole bunch of signals. They go into one device, like uh, they have uh, d like... Um, multiplexing devices and you buy one of those you plug all those lines into it and then it mixes all the signals together sends it down one line and then you have another device at another end which is a demultiplexer and then it puts all the right information back on the individual line so this is a really uh 
cool device and I've got a lot of experience with these working with the Highway Patrol and I actually worked at a company where we manufactured these uh, a long time ago. Um, so here's another uh, image. So you have your different uh, computers that would plug into it and then it multiplexes it, sends it to where it's going and then the demultiplexer uh, gets it and sends the right signals to each side. Um, and then it could reverse as well. And uh, these computers could talk to that, those ones so and so forth. So um, multiplexing and demultiplexing is taking a bunch of signals, combining them, sending them over one line, and then uh, sorting them out on the other end. Okay. Let's see here baseband broadband i'm gonna just let you guys read about that that one's not too complicated um your fast ethernet your gigabyte ethernet um just different uh categories basically um you will have to know the speeds and the characteristics of these type of uh uh different uh cables as you uh go forth um and so make sure that you kind of uh pay attention to these this is the networking is heavily reliant on the cable so it's that's important and you have charts like this that uh show you uh <clears throat> the different types of network architecture the topology uh what the cable's called the uh, transfer rate and then um the different access methods so um just a lot of memorization basically or uh years of experience uh, let's see here. So, for operating systems, I mean, I'm sure everybody's pretty familiar with like Windows um, and so forth. They have versions for the servers as well. So, like you have your Windows Home version or your Windows Professional version or whatever you're using at home. And then uh, if you're uh, using servers at work or whatever, then the server has to have its own operating system. And uh, you can have Unix, Linux, uh, Windows, and uh, there's different types of uh, operating systems. So you can have file and print servers, uh, DNS, uh, which is domain name system, uh, which you'll learn about uh, going forward, DHCP, directory web, email servers, group policies, and so forth. Um, and you'll get, we'll get more into that uh, as we go forward. All right, so let's uh, take a look here. Clients and resources, directory services, uh, Unix, Linux, all right, so let's see here. The two-minute drill. Uh, make sure you can go through this and that you know all this stuff because this is the highlights from what we talked about. So go through here. Make sure you uh, got this stuff down. And then you have your self-test. This is a good thing to go through. Uh, kind of reinforce what you uh, read about and learned about and make sure that you got that stuff down. And then it does have the answer so you can make sure that you're right. And then next week, we'll be talking about network protocols and standards. So I can't wait to talk to you about that. So I hope <clears throat> that this was somewhat helpful. Feel free to give me feedback on uh, the uh, lectures. And if you uh, got any questions or anything, feel free to reach out to me. Other than that, uh, have a wonderful evening, and I'll talk to you next week.